Bhakati vi 
Okay, we're, last night we did lesson three, so tonight's lesson four. But we're jumping a little bit. We're going up to mantras nine to fourteen. You know how many mantras are in the Ishopanishad? Huh? Not quite seventeen. Eighteen. There are eighteen mantras in the Isha. How many chapters in Bhagavad Gita? Eighteen. Yes. How many slokas in the Bhagavad Gita? Seven hundred. Yes. Good. Okay. The gate's closed, you know. Do you keep the gate closed all the time? Okay, so in Srimad Bhagavatam how many cantos? Srimad Bhagavatam how many cantos? No, twelve cantos, yes, twelve cantos in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And they say eighteen thousand slokas. So you can read for your whole life. <coughs> and Ishopanishad, you can read. But if you read a mantra a day, eighteen days can finish. All right. So 
mantras 9 to 14 we're going to look at tonight. But overview, <coughs> the first section was mantras 1 to 3, right? Last night we covered mantras 1 to 3. Remember the first mantra? Isavasyam midam sarvam Yad kincha jagatyam jagat Tena tyak tena bunjita Magridaha kashasvitanam Right? Translation Everything animate and inanimate that is within the universe is controlled and owned by the Lord. One should therefore accept only those things necessary for himself, which are set aside as his quota. And one should not accept more, knowing well to whom it belongs. Right? So we are taught to take our quota. And taking a quota means also do your quota, right? And do what we are expected to do. Right? If you're at school, you're expected to do the homework, right? You're expected to come to the class, you're expected to do different things for the teachers. So our quota, do our quota and take our quota, and don't take more. We don't do more than our quota <laughs> and we shouldn't take more than our quota. So. Uh, that was explained in the first mantra. And the second mantra explained what would happen if you live, if you do like that, what would be the result? If, you, if, we, if, we, live, if we live according to that law, just take our quota, what is the result? Huh? Yes, yes. It said you would live for hundreds of years. Do you want to live for hundreds of years? No, right? We don't. That, you don't want to live hundreds of years? Really? Hmm. Well, we're all spirit souls. So the body may die, but the soul never dies. The soul lives forever. So anyway, you live for hundreds of years. For, because that work, that sort of work will not bind you to the laws of karma. Because of our karma, we live a short life. But when we follow the laws of the Supreme Lord, we can live a long life. And what happens when you don't live according to the laws of the Lord? What's the result? What, do, what happens? Remember? Atmaha, killer of the soul, right, we kill the soul, we kill our spiritual nature. And that means that the result is we, we enter into the regions of faithlessness, full of darkness and ignorance. People have no faith, and they, so they live in darkness and ignorance. So that's, what's hap that's what happens when you don't follow that principle, right? So the first mantra was about proprietorship and the laws of God. And then mantras 4 to mantra 8, which we're not covering tonight, it's about the vision of the Maha Bhagavat. The Maha Bhagavat is a devotee, is a great devotee, it's called a Maha Bhagavat. There's the book Bhagavat and the person Bhagavat, right? Person Bhagavat. Are you a Mahabhagavat Prabhu? This? The young Prabhu there? <laughs> yes? Playing the drums? So the, vis the vision of the Mahabhagavat, how he sees the world, the vi how these great devotees see everything. They see everything, they see everyone as a soul, as a part of the Supreme Lord. 
They don't make distinction, they don't discriminate, they don't see any difference between one person and another. We see every living entity as spiritual beings. So that's the vision of the Mahabhagavat. Anyway, we'll hear about that another time when we do the, the next mantra. But tonight we're going to cover mantras 9 to 14, which is about the absolute and the relative. Right? There's the absolute, that which is absolute which is the eternal and the relative, relative, there's the absolute truth and the relative truth. Relative truth is true today, may not be true tomorrow, right? R absolute truth is it's true all the time. We may say, oh, it was very hot today. That was a relative truth. T is tomorrow may be rainy again, it may not be so hot. So, the relative truth, it changes. It's true one day, it's not true the next. But absolute truth, it's always true, every day, all the time. So we want to understand the absolute truth and then the relative truth. and the. One way to understand the absolute and the relative is in terms of knowledge. Some knowledge is absolute and some knowledge is temporary or relative. It's relative. Like you may say, I'm in my country. That's relatively true. It's true today, but may not be true in the future. But the absolute truth is true all the time. We want to understand the absolute. And at the same time, know the difference between the absolute and the relative. So that one way is in terms of knowledge and the other is in terms of worship. Some people worship the absolute truth and some people worship relative truth. Prabhupada tells one man, during the Second World War, he worshipped Hitler because he made a lot of money. He made a lot of money. By, during the Second World War, he was able to make a lot of money. So he was so happy, he was worshipping Hitler. <coughs> so that's a relative truth. Where that kind of worship is relative. And people worship different devatas also, different demigoddesses and devatas. They worship them for temporary benefit. Just like me want to get money. So you worship the goddess Lakshmi to get wealth. That's a, a, a relative kind of worship. Because once you get the money, then you may not worship anymore. Now I've got my money, I don't need to worship anymore. And somebody, someone else is worshipping, they, they want to marry a nice woman, so they worship someone like Uma, and then when they get the wife, then they don't need to worship anymore because they've got the wife already, right? And the girl will worship Shiva to get the husband. Right? And when they get the husband, then they, they may not worship anymore. Or they, they may keep worshipping. Anyway, it's relative, that kind of worship. But there's absolute <coughs> worship. Absolute worship is to worship the Supreme Lord above all of the different gods and goddesses. Okay? And then the final section of the Ishopanishad, mantras 15 to 18 are prayers to be offered at the time of death. Prayers at the time of death. It's a fortunate soul who is able to pray at the time of death. Someone gave me a book recently about a young girl 
who lived in India and she had muscular dystrophy. So, you know, she was paralyzed and couldn't walk and couldn't breathe and fighting for her life. And then she finally departed from the world when she was like 21 or 22. And she wrote, she was keeping a diary, you know, and she was describing her realizations and her struggle for life. Her mother and father were devotees and she had an older sister also who was devotee. And she had a lot of association many different spiritual teachers had met her and they had all encouraged her and she had read Indra Jumna Swami's diary of a traveling preacher. Did you ever read it? Diary of a traveling preacher by Indra, His Holiness Indra Jumna Swami. It's very nice. Indra Jumna Swami, he, he's a Prabhupada disciple and he travels and preaches and he puts on festivals, especially in Poland every summer and in India also. He comes also to other parts of the world. He's a, an American, tall American, and he, he has always nice kirtan and he has a group of young men who travel with him and they do wonderful kirtan. And they went up to Hardwar and they were up there for two weeks doing kirtan every night with many people. So she read anyway his diary and she got inspired and she wrote, started writing her own diary. You know, of course she was not going anywhere, she was just staying at home because she was in such very bad physical conditions. But still very nice, her consciousness was very good. She was celebrating all the different acharyas, appearances and disappearances. And she'd even had initiation. She'd taken initiation from His Holiness Giri Raj Swami. So anyway, it's very, very nice. She was preparing for her death constantly. You know, she knew she's very close to death. And so she was preparing for that departure. So very feeling to read her writings and her uh, realizations. So here the Ishopanishad tells us prayers which we can offer at the time of death. You know, one of the prayers is, Oh my Lord, please remember all my sacrifices. And because you are ultimate, because you are the ultimate beneficiary, please bestow your mercy on me, like that. You know, praying to the to the Lord in some way. We pray also every day. I hope, right? How do you pray? What do you pray? Yes. Do you pray every day? Yes. Well, how? What do you pray? Huh? You just, yeah, that's the prayer. That's the prayer. The Hare Krishna mantra is a prayer. It's a prayer and it's the answer to our prayers also. Because we're praying to Krishna, O oh Lord Krishna, O oh Lord Rama, O oh Lord Hari, please engage me in your service. We're praying to Lord Krishna and Lord Rama. And by praying in that way, we are being engaged in His service because we are chanting the holy name. So it's a prayer and it's the answer to our prayers also. So very important. I hope you remember to pray every day, right? So tonight we are going to look mantras 14, the absolute and the relative. So the first three mantras are in terms of knowledge. Mantra 9 Andantamaha Pravishanti Andantamaha Pravishanti Ye Vidyam Mupasate Ye Vidyam Mupasate 
Translation Those who engage in the culture of nashaind activities. Do you know what is nashaind activities? Who knows? Yes? What is nashaind activities? Huh? Unnecessary, unnecessary, unnecessary. Unnecessary activities. Yes. Why are they unnecessary? Why are they unnecessary? Not to yes, right. They're not related to our soul. They're not related to Krishna consciousness. Neshaind activities, materialistic activities. So if we are engaged in the culture of nashaind activities, then we shall enter into the darkest region of ignorance. Right? You want to go there? No, right? Worse, but worse still are those engaged in the culture of so-called knowledge. They're even worse. They're engaged in the culture of so-called knowledge. Oh, that's very bad. <laughs> so, neshaind activities is bad, but so-called knowledge are even worse because we're doing something very wrong. We're very off track. Neshaind activities, we're just ignorant, we just don't know. But so-called knowledge, people, they think they know. They think they know something, but it's all wrong and it's totally misleading to people and confusing them. And it's, so it's very badly condemned. And they get even worse punishment than those who are engaged in neshaind activities. On the Back to Godhead magazine, the, and the oh, Srila Prabhupada's Back to Godhead magazine, and you probably don't get Back to Godhead here, do you? Huh? You get it? You get it? Do you ever see Back to Godhead? Yes. Sometimes. So on the cover of the Back to Godhead, Prabhupada designed the logo for the Back to Godhead magazine that Godhead is light, nascent is darkness. Where there is Godhead, there is light. Where there is nascent, there is darkness. So Prabhupada describes the difference. There's nascent activities which are all in relation to the body, to the ignorant body just for sense gratification. So it's compared to darkness. But Godhead, where there is Godhead, that is light. And in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's also said, Krishna Surya Sama Maya Haya Andhikar. Krishna is like the sun and Maya is like darkness, right? Where there is Krishna, there's no maya. And where there is light, there's no darkness. Right? As soon as we put the lights on, the darkness is removed. And the same way, wherever Krishna is introduced, then there's no maya. Of course, we have to be Krishna conscious. We have to bring in the proper way, the proper understanding of Lord Krishna. It shouldn't be so-called knowledge. So-called knowledge. People are thinking they know, but it's all wrong and it's all confusing and misleading. So that kind of knowledge is very dangerous. And they have no parampara. Right? They're not connected in the disciplic succession. And they're speaking, they're trying to explain Bhagavad Gita without knowledge of the parampara. 
And so they give all the wrong understandings and they will present things by their own ideas. They will say Krishna is like the doctor and Arjuna is the patient. Hmm? And Krishna is giving the medicine. All right? It's all speculation, you see, all nonsense. So we have to hear from the proper people through parampara. It's very important. There are so many Bhagavad Gita's and so many people say, yes, yes, I have Bhagavad Gita, but they, they don't know what is the real message of the Bhagavad Gita. So-called knowledge, all wrong knowledge. So they're very dangerous people. All right? Prabhupada explains. He said, modern civilization has advanced considerably in the field of mass education. But the result is that people are more unhappy than ever before because of the stress placed on material advancement to the exclusion of the most important part of life, the spiritual aspect. Right? So this is very important. We put a lot of emphasis on mass education. Nowadays everyone has to go to school. You know, if we'd come to Sarawak a hundred years ago, or, you know, maybe the, there wouldn't, wouldn't be many, many schools, you know, the government wouldn't have schools or anything. Maybe sometimes, you know, you have the, a few monks or a few priests. Here, this is a Catholic country, cat, more Catholic. So, the Catholic Church, they would bring the priests and the nuns, and they would open a little school, and they will teach a little bit to the children. In countries like Thailand, it would be the Buddhist monks. And in India, it would be the priests, the Brahmana priests. In the temples, they would teach a little bit to some, to some fortunate people. But nowadays, mass education, right? Everybody has to go to school. Everybody has to learn reading, writing, and everyone has to have a, a, a mobile phone. Then you have to do so many things with your mobile phone. You have to pay for everything with your mobile phone, you know, we become digitalized. So this kind of technology is going on, mass education. But are people more happy? You see, this girl is not happy. She should be happy. So nice girl. You should be happy. But not, not happy. Why? Because of the stress placed on the advancement of the world. The ad so-called advancement. She's thinking, I don't have a nice car for myself to drive. She's thinking, I should have the latest mobile phone, right? And I should have the mo <laughs> yeah, so many things. You know, that the stress which is placed on people to keep up with others, you know, that, oh, oh, you still have that old thing? Oh, you don't have a new car yet? You still have that old car? Oh, my gosh. What's wrong with you? I like that, you know. So the, the people put st a lot of pressure on other people that you have to keep up with the Joneses, we would say. <laughs> keep up with, the, with the, the top class of the people. So they don't care about the spiritual aspect of life. They're only thinking about the body. How many digits are in your bank account? Or you only have four digits or five digits in your bank? No, no, you can't come with me. You have to have eight or nine digits in your bank account. 
then you can come with me. And the girl thinks, and the boy comes, please marry me. And she how many digits have you got in your bank account? Oh, no, no, not enough. Sorry, I don't want you. Right? Oh. And the boy has to go and work and make money and try to get enough money. It's all like that people forget about the soul. So this is very important. And Prabhupada says, the advancement of learning by a godless people is as dangerous as a valuable jewel on the head of a cobra. Oh, Krishna, what happened? Hare Krishna. What happened now? Maybe I went, maybe my power is Huh? Power debt. Power debt. Power debt. Get my bag. Get my... My... Oh, can you go upstairs and get the extension cord to charge? It, it's on, it's plugged in. Okay. At the table. Anyway, Prabhupada was describing about the jewel on the head of a cobra, a jewel on the head of a cobra. Did you ever see the cobra with a jewel on his head? Some, there are some snakes like that. They have a jewel on their head. They're not very common, but sometimes you do find them, you know? And naturally, of course, they're very attractive to people. Why? Why are they so attractive? Because you want the jewel, right? <laughs> you're thinking, you're, we're thinking, wow, if I can get that snake, I'll take the jewel from its head, you know? Jai Jagannath Paladi Subhadra Gornitai Ki Jai. I don't know, I thought I charged my computer today. How this happened? So the jewel on the head of the cobra makes something very, makes that cobra very attractive. But a cobra is a deadly snake, right? If it bites you, oh yeah, <laughs> you're finished, you know. The poison from the cobra will go right through the body, it will kill you. People die. Even Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's first wife was Vishnu Priya. And Vishnu Priya, well, Lord Chaitanya had gone traveling. He'd gone to Bangladesh, traveling, teaching, to earn some income for the family. And while he was away, his wife was bitten by a snake. Right? So he lost his, he lost his wife, lost his first wife. And we hear also about Narada Muni, in his previous life, before he became the son of Brahma, he was the son of a maidservant woman. But as the son of a maidservant woman, he lost his mother while he was still a young boy. She was also bitten by a snake. So snake bites are deadly, and certainly if there's a snake around, we want to, you know, we'll run away, we'll just, we'll just go away, get away from there, you know. But when there's a, a jewel on the head of the snake, then it becomes attractive. We want to get the jewel. We want to, oh, I'll, I'll take that snake for myself, I'll find that snake, I'll play with it. I'll have that, when I have the jewel, the snake with the jewel on it said, everyone will want to come and see it. Everyone will be, oh, they'll praise me that, oh, you've got a jewel, you've got a snake with a jewel on its head, wow, oh, you're so fortunate. It's so like that. So the godless civilization which is educated is like that. It's like it's like a, a, a jewel on the head of the snake. 
that people are educated but they're godless. They have no spiritual knowledge. They don't understand anything about God and their eternal relationship with God, with the Lord. Yeah, it needs it needs to be charging shown now. It needs to be charged. Well there is an adapter, you know, you have to bring the adapter as well, Prabhu. Come on, there's a two plug. I think should go usually usually we'll go in here but maybe oh I'll take this one out. Did you bring her? <laughs> Not yet. Okay, coming. <coughs> All right, a cobra decorated with jewel is more dangerous than one not decorated. So the advancement of learning in godless people it's as dangerous, the advancement of learning. If people are godless but they're advanced in learning, they're good in making bombs, they're b good in making guns, they're good in making ways to kill people. Okay, wait.
You start show me the middle option. Middle option, middle option. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. What did you do? Can I can I have a look at this first? Show panel actually. It's not showing this thing. Who click with who click record? The option is not seen here, Bravo. No, it's not showing. It's showing the slides here, and then it's showing different things. Sorry, man. Ah, okay. Don't show. Okay. Record the link, lor. No, it's not recording for me. Play from start. I think almost. Yeah, it's for the same shot. It's for the three dots. Okay. I saw this paper. Okay. So the godless civilization is more dangerous. <laughs> it's more dangerous than. A, a civilization in which the masses of people are less educated. Masses of people are less educated. They 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 would simply know. They would not, maybe they know how to do their farming. They can grow their food. They can you know take care of their animals, like that. They know the basic needs for their civilization. But the more we have what is called, we call education, the, we learn to do terrible things, like make bombs and go, like now you, of course we have things like terrorists also, who go around, they're expert in killing, try to kill a lot of people. And of course the, we had also that terrorism, the, the people took the airplanes and flew it into the Twin Towers in New York and killed thousands of people at one time. So, you know, they thought, oh, this is great, this is advancement of civilization. Advancement in killing. Of course, that is not the purpose of advancement. We want to value the life and to pr protect people and to care for people, not to kill people. And so, education it sometimes it's misdirected. People don't know how to use it. I met one young man <coughs> recently. I asked him, what are you studying? He said, I'm studying AI. You know AI? Artificial intelligence. I said, well, that's putting people out of jobs. <laughs> you know? 
it it would be better if you could create jobs for people but the modern technology is to put people out of jobs nowadays when you come in the airport you come to immigration there's no people anymore it's all just you know machines and you put your passport there and they take a picture and the glass door opens and you go through you know and there's nobody there there's nobody so people are out of jobs so many people were out of Prabhupada said all of this technology putting people out of jobs Prabhupada saw the tractors coming into the villages in India and he said it's making people unemployed bringing the tractors is taking away the jobs from people and because of that the young people go off to the cities and they go to the cities and they get polluted by the modern civilization go into the city life there are bars and there's drugs and there's gambling and so many sinful activities are all there so people become exposed to all of these things they go away from nature they go into the city life created by people how to destroy the culture of people oh krishna not working oh okay wait uh -huh. All right. I don't know what happened Okay. <coughs> All right, so we were we were up to here. We we asked how would you present this statement to a modern audience? This statement that the masses of and the civilization which people are less educated is not as dangerous as a civilization in which people are so-called educated. Well, modern people, of course, they think education is very important, right? And we, people will spend a lot of money and uh, certainly we encourage uh, the children, go to school, you have to go to school, you have to get education, and if they do well in the education, you congratulate them, oh very good, you've done very well, like, and the children even want to go on to higher education, right? And, and people want to go to foreign countries for education like this. So we're saying here, it, a civilization in which the mass of people are less educated is better than one in which people are more educated. We have to we have to understand that that there is good there is good and bad in everything you see so people if people are educated in nascent activities then they're simply introduced to the the way of material life and they're introduced to the world of competition and they they want to be the best. And you should do the best for your company in your, in the, in your, or your country. If you're in China, they'll train you, do the best for your country. You know, everything is for the glory of the country. And if you're working for the multinational corporation, you do the best for your company. You wake up in the morning and you should breathe, my company, I have to, <laughs> you know, I have to go out and make money and make a lot of, in, and bring in new technology to the glory of our company, that everyone will know how great our organization is. 
like that, they, 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 they want people to work for their companies in that kind of mood, very competitive, that we are the best, you see, the competitive society. So that kind of education creates a lot of bitterness and, you know, a, a, a lack of harmony in the world. People are not able to work together and get along with each other because you're not only working against other companies, you're working against other people. I met this one young person in Delhi and they were working in Gurgong. In Gurgong in Delhi, it's become like New York. You know, everywhere is all skyscraper buildings and everything. And she told, she, this young lady told me, she, she said, I worked very hard to get this job, to finally get into this multinational company. And she said, it's so terrible, it's so horrible that all the people are so nasty to each other. Nobody has a friendly relationship with each other. They're all competing with each other to get to the top. We want to be the best, want to be on top, number one, right? That, that is the mood. And Prabhupada even met like that too. When Prabhupada, in Prabhupada's time he went to Japan to the printing company, Dynapon Printers, and he met with the board of directors and each of the directors they gave the name card to Prabhupada. And they were talking about the prices and the printing of Prabhupada's books. And then at a certain point, you know, the discussion finished and the directors all got up and went away and Prabhupada was left with one young man, the youngest of the directors. And so Prabhupada was talking to him and he asked him, he said, what is your goal in life? And so the young man took out his name card. His name card was on the bottom of all the name cards and he put his name card on the top. He said, that is my goal of life. <laughs> That is the mood which people have in the material world. We want to be the greatest, we should be number one, we should be on top. It's so foolish, you know, it's, how long can you last like that? So we, we want to inform people about how there's education, there's proper use of education and the dangers of education also with everything. There's some good, there's also bad. It's how you use it. So we have to be careful to people. How we present these things to people. And you, you see people also, they, they will spend so much money for education. They think it's so important. And they, they send their children into the educational institutes and they become ruined. Bad association. Bad people, you know, <coughs> young men flirting with the young women and wanting to go out with the young women. There was this young Indian girl, she was studying in America and some one man, young man asked her to take, wanted her to go out with him. So she asked her mother, can I go out with him? The mother was shocked. She said, if you go out with him, you're no more my daughter. <laughs> She didn't want, she didn't approve, you know, that's not ch chastity, right? So, these problems are there, all right? So, Mantra 10 then speaks about the wise have explained, one result is derived from the culture of knowledge and a different result is obtained from the culture of Neshaind. Obviously, right? You culture, culture knowledge, knowledge meaning vidya, spiritual knowledge, and nishans is materialistic knowledge, avidya. So they're very different things. Avidya, you know, people have MA, we say master of avidya. <laughs> and it's a master of avidya, your MA. <coughs> So, what is the value of that kind of knowledge? It's not useful. You get a very different result. Vidyaya k 
culture of knowledge. The culture of knowledge, it's described here, one should become a perfect gentleman and learn to give proper respect to others. Prabhupada was on the television program and the man asked Srila Prabhupada, how would I recognize one of your devotees? And Prabhupada didn't say, oh, they have big tilak on their foreheads. He didn't say, oh, they have big neck beads around the neck. He didn't say they have a japa bag. He said, they would be a perfect gentleman. Mm. So here also, one should become a perfect gentleman. And what does it mean to be a perfect gentleman? To give proper respect to others. So this is from the Mantra 10. And we quote here from the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita 13th. In, uh, chapter 13th, is it? I think so. Uh, the different qualities of one in knowledge. If you study the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna is describing different qualities of knowledge. And they begin the very first quality of one in knowledge. Amanitvam Adamvitvam. Amanitvam means humility, and Adamvitvam means pridelessness. To be without pride means that we are able to offer respect to others. And humility, to be humble, we should think of ourselves. How should we think of ourselves? Huh? Yes, in, in the Shikshastikam, right? Lower than the blade of grass, right? Why? What's the point? Huh? Yes. Lower than the blade of grass. We should think of ourselves as a spirit soul. What is the size of the soul? How big is the soul? Huh? One? One ten thousand? of the tip of the hair, one hundredth of one hundredth of a tip of a hair. Is it very big? Very small, right? And our ego should be like that. We shouldn't think, I'm five foot ten, I'm two meters tall. No, we should think, I am one ten thousandth of the tip of the hair. That is the true ego. So. When we think like that, then we will be humble and we will be tolerant, like tolerant, like the tree, right? as tolerant as a tree. Tolerate the heat and the cold and the wind and the rain, the tree tolerates. So we have to become like that, to be humble and without pride. This is, this is the sign of Education, this is the culture of knowledge. Real education will train people in that way. Just like you go to Gurukula, what do they learn in Gurukula? We learn to bow down, to bow down, to offer obeisances to the teachers like that. You go to school today, you, how do the students treat the teachers today, you know? <laughs> it's a different world, you know. So, uh, we should cultivate knowledge like that. In the modern society, even a boy thinks himself self-sufficient and pays no respect to elderly men due to the wrong type of education being imparted in our universities. Boys all over the world are giving their elders headaches. <laughs> so, this is a result of the wrong kind of education. The wrong kind of education. We're being educated in how to use computers for 
nonsense activities. And sometimes they use so many things. There will, there will be pornography, and there will be gambling, and there will be so much uh, corruption and cheating going on. All using different systems of, of education to take away the wealth from people by some illegal means. So universities, Prabhupada said they were like a slaughterhouse because the people, even they would be, they would be good before they go to university, but after they've been in the university, then they're introduced to so many bad things. They're introduced to all the bad habits. Oh, you're a vegetarian? Oh, what's wrong with you? Don't you know? We eat everything. No, we eat vegetables, we eat everything. <laughs> and like that you become drawn into all the misbehavior, all the nonsense activities which people perform. So, culture of knowledge. We ask you, just like, how would you relate to senior devotees in the temple who may not have completed a Bhakti Shastri degree? This, this is a situation which sometimes creates a problem in our temples, you know. People would come to Mayapur and take a Bhakti Shastri degree. Kripa Sindhu Prabhu, he went to Mayapur, he did the Bhakti Shastri degree. So many of our Mayapur Malaysian devotees, they went to Mayapur, they stayed there, they did Bhakti Shastri degree. But, but sometimes the problem is, some of the temples would complain, that is that after they come back from the Bhakti Shastri course, they think they know everything. They don't want to go to class anymore. They don't want to hear other people give class. They think, oh no, I know more than him. I don't need to hear him. You know, I've done the Bhakti Shastri. I'm a graduate of the Bhakti Shastri. I know everything. So I don't need to hear from anyone. So it's important for us, especially senior devotees, you know, senior devotee, what does it mean to be senior? Well, somebody may be senior by realization. And they may have studied the scriptures and they've understood a lot. They have a lot of knowledge, so they're senior. And somebody else is senior maybe by position. Maybe they're taking a big responsibility. You know, as in the temple, we need people to take responsibility to manage and to look after the money and to handle accounts and to deal with guests and people when they come. These different things have to be done. So somebody may be senior in that respect. And somebody else may be senior in terms of initiation. They've been around a long time. They got initiated a long time ago and they're senior by initiation. And somebody else may be senior by their age, just simply by their age, that they've been in the material world and their body's older than others. So they're also senior. So there's different types of seniority. But they're all senior. Somebody, they may not even be initiated, but they've been around a long time. They have a lot of experience of the material world. You know, young people, you never had a child, you're not married even yet, you don't know what it was like to have a child and to bring up a family, all of these things, these experiences, you, you haven't had that yet. So you're inexperienced in some things, right? And somebody else, they've, had all, they've been through all that, they've had that experience. They have a family, they were married, they have family, they brought up the family. They had a lot of experience bringing up the family. And so people get that kind of experience. And, and some people get their experience just meeting people and talking to them. And some people get their knowledge just reading books, 
just from reading books they get a lot of knowledge. Well, there are different ways in which you can cultivate knowledge. So we should be respectful to people. We should think we can learn from everyone. We, we shouldn't think, oh, I don't need to hear from him, I know everything. We, we, we need to be open and willing to hear from different people. What do they have to say? And then we can always supplement what they say by asking a good question, a relevant question. Even if they just speak basic stuff, you can always ask a question which helps them to speak more. So like that, we should be willing to hear from the senior devotees. Okay? Then mantra 11. Only one who can learn the process of nescience and that of transcendental knowledge side by side can transcend the influence of repeated birth and death and enjoy the full blessings of immortality. So, we have to learn both the vidya and the avidya side by side. We have to learn both things. It doesn't mean, oh, I have to go out, I better go out and try the drugs. I have to go out and eat meat. I have to get drunk and I'll know what it's like. No, you don't have to do all that. You know, but we do have to learn about the dangers of these things. We have to know these things, you know. We have to know what are the problems which are going to come from it. So, cultivate that knowledge side by side and cultivate in Krishna consciousness, we get that opportunity. Right? Here's Mantra 11. Vidyam cha vidyam cha yas. Vidyam cha vidyam cha yas. Sadvedo bayam saha. Right? Well, this is Mantra 11, from Mantra 11, saying we have to cultivate both the vidya and the avidya. We have to... We also have to learn to read and write. You know, if we can't read and write, how will we read Prabhupada's books? We have to learn these things. We have to learn how to cook. You have to learn how to use the different spices. You have to learn to play the instruments. You have to learn sing the songs and cultivate the, uh, the spiritual knowledge. So, Sri Ishopanishad instructs us not to make one-sided attempts to win the struggle for existence. One-sided attempt means don't just only go on the vidya, but you have to cultivate knowledge of avidya also. We have to know about the dangers of the material world. At the same time, we have to know about the positive aspects of spiritual life. Why should I be a devotee? Why should I be Krishna conscious? Well, it's a much better life than the materialist. What is the life of the materialist? What is their life? They work hard all day, they go out at night to drink alcohol, get drunk, wake up the next morning with a hangover, go off to work. Do you want that kind of life? Do you want a husband like that? <laughs> Boy, he has a good job, he makes a lot of money. He just drinks a lot, you know. And he gambles and he smokes a lot, you know. And he's got a bad temper and he may beat you, you know. <laughs> but, but if you marry a Krishna conscious devotee, then it will be much better, you know. He'll be at least more civilized, cultured person. And so that's important. So we have to... We have to cultivate both sides. Prabhupada said, This does not mean that all activities for the maintenance of the body should be stopped. There is no question of stopping activities. All the activities for the maintenance of the body, you know, working, earning money and so on, we have to do these things. You know, you have to live in the material world, we have to have a job, we have to generate some income, we have to pay the bills, you know, you're living in here in the material world, we have to pay the different people, you have to pay the taxes to the government, you have to pay the landlord, 
you have to pay for the electricity, you have to pay for water, you have to pay your phone bill, so many things you have to do. So you, you can't neglect all these things. A Prabhupada explains, just as there is no question of wiping out one's temperature altogether when trying to revive, I mean, when trying to recover from a disease, just like maybe the, the patient has a fever and you call the doctor and the doctor comes and says, oh, okay, I'll give him a jab and he gives an injection and the patient dies. And the doctor says, well, fever's gone. <laughs> say, no, he's dead, he's dead. But the doctor says, well, fever's gone, fever's gone. So like the impersonalism is like that. Mayavadis, they want to make everything zero. And the materialists, they want to increase the fever. Right? You've already, 98.4, uh, you've already got a big fever, and you want to increase the temperature more and more. So material life is like that. We want to increase the fever. And the Mayavadi, they want to wipe out the temperature. So both is not right. You want to bring the body back to the normal temperature, right? You have to bring the body to the right temperature. So Prabhupada said, to make the best use of a bad bargain is the appropriate expression. The great sages and saints of India have attempted to do this by a balanced program of spiritual and material knowledge. Just like when we read Srimad Bhagavatam, it's not just only spiritual knowledge. There's a lot of material knowledge there also. How to receive guests, what is the proper reception and so on. And all of these different things are introduced to us. And how to take care of departed souls, how to provide the, the proper spiritual atmosphere for people to make advancement. We have to cultivate both the spiritual and the material knowledge. When world, at the same time we have to know how to use the different things in the material world. So there has to be this balance, the spiritual part of life and the material. Just like here, you have to, you have, to have a car, we have to drive the car. We can't, oh, I don't know anything about cars, you know. <laughs> it's a great advantage if you can drive a car here, right? There's no public transport around here. You can't go outside and say, I'll just wait for the bus. You could spend your whole life waiting for the bus. The bus will never come, right? There's no buses coming here. You have to have your own transport. In Malaysia, it's a bit like that, you know, everywhere in Malaysia. There's not very good public transport and people have to drive their own motorbike or they have a car or something. And so they have to know how to do these things. That is material knowledge, but you've got to know these things. And Prabhupada expected us to know these things also. At the same time, spiritual knowledge is also required. And Prabhupada would also say, what is that sloka? What is the meaning? You know, Prabhupada would regularly be asked, Oh, you're singing this bhajan. What is the meaning of this bhajan? You're singing this song. Do you know the meaning? Like that, Prabhupada would be constantly testing us. We have to know the material and the spiritual. They expected us to keep accounts for the temple. Prabhupada would say, Show me the accounts. I want to see everything. And we have to show Prabhupada the accounts. And like that, satis satisfy Srila Prabhupada that we're doing everything properly. Prabhupada trained us in all these things, spiritually and materially. Both are important. So making proper use of material knowledge in the service of Krishna. Hmm? All right, so we, we, we try to do like that. How does this process of spiritual life given to us by Srila Prabhupada, enable us to achieve a balanced program of spiritual and material knowledge. 
a balanced program, spiritual and material knowledge. Prabhupada has given us that kind of program in Krishna consciousness. Just by being in the Krishna consciousness movement, we learn so many practical things, how to live in the world. There was just, I, I, I was in the Middle East and the, one family told me they went to uh, Hungary, they went to the Krishna Valley in Hungary, Shivaram Swami has cultivated a, he's Hungarian, you know, originally he's a Hungarian. He joined the movement in Canada and later on he came, after becoming a sannyasi and so on, uh, he went to Hungary and he introduced Krishna consciousness in Hungary. And they've developed one region, a, a farm area there, they call it Krishna Valley. And uh, so one family, they were on holiday, they went to visit Hungary, they wanted to see the Krishna Valley. It's well known in Hungary, it's become very popular. And they have the temple also in Budapest and the devotees are regularly going on Harinam Sankirtan. And so Shivaram Swami, he met this family and they came there and, and Shivaram Swami said to the one man, he said, he said, oh you've got two sons. He said, why don't you give one son to me? <laughs> and, 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 and the man said, well, if they want to, they can, if, one, if one of them wants to go, they can go. And so Shiva Ram Swami asked the one boy, he said, do you want to go? He said, yeah, I'd like to come. <laughs> so the boy went off, to, he's staying in Hungary, and he's spent, going to spend three years. He said, yeah, it's good, you come and stay in the ashram, get trained in brahmachari life, Later on you can always go to study at university and do your education, finish your education. But spend a few years in the association of devotee, in the Brahmachari Ashram. Go out every day, do some Harinam Sankirtan and also learn different things, you know, do that sometimes working on the land, farming, because they have land there, they have cows also take care of the cows sometimes and go in the kitchen, help in the kitchen, cutting the vegetables and helping sometimes even maybe cooking a little bit or rolling the chapatis and things. But get trained up, get, get also a little bit detached from the family life, you know, because being at home in the family, the mother is always there, you know, to take care of everything. And so become a little stronger living in the ashram, you know, stand on your own feet and take care of yourself. So the devotee, he, he, he's doing that. He's living there in Hungary now and he's uh, practicing. Life. And he'll do it for a few years and after a few years then he'll come back and finish his education and he can go on and then get married and so on. But it's a good program. Balance spiritual and material knowledge. We, by being in Krishna consciousness, we get good spiritual education and material education. We learn how to do things, you know. Often you get these young girls today, they don't even know how to cook. Oh, that's a big problem if a girl doesn't know how to cook. You know, what is the good of a... She may be very beautiful, but, but if she cannot cook, you starve, right? <laughs> Not very good. So you get these girls, you know, they look very attractive, you know, they look very... They dress very... <laughs> ask them to cook. Huh? <laughs> they have no idea. They never go in the kitchen. There was a, this one girl, uh, she... she there, must be there, more than 30 now. And, and she got sick. I said, my mother, mother, you have to come and take care of me. <laughs> I can't cook. <laughs> uh -huh. it's, so, it, it's so common, you know, young women, you know, they, they don't know how to cook. Oh, oh, we'll just go to McDonald's, you know, we get KFC is there, you know, you go to the, these places to get the caddy out and eat the garbage food. <laughs> Hmm. So, you know, people have to learn these basic things. Men as well have to learn cooking and cleaning, keeping everything neat and clean. It's very important. Another devotee I know is doing a business, 
helping people organize their home, putting their home in order, because everything is so cluttered everywhere, you know, stuff everywhere. They don't fold up anything, they don't keep anything. So he, he, he has a business just helping people to put their home together, making it nice and neat and orderly. So we learn all of these things in Krishna consciousness. And we learn how to live simply, not, accumu not accumulating more than necessary. Just minimizing the demands of the body. It's very necessary today. I was talking yesterday about the consumer society. We accumulate too much. And if you study the nectar of instruction, First, the first thing to be of atyahara, meaning overeating and over collecting. Collecting what? Too many dresses, too many jewelries, too many shoes, too much makeup, too many creams. <laughs> this, that one. Yes, it's all true. We have to be very careful, try to keep simple, living simply, high thinking. So Krishna conscious life is good for that. You live in the ashram, people will take your stuff anyway. <laughs> You'll soon become detached. <laughs> uh, where did my cream go? Oh, somebody took my soap. Oh. <laughs> okay, so... If we had more time, we could have you all do a drama, right? Okay, so then Mantra 14, about in terms of worship, in terms of worship, Andanta Maha Pravishanti Ye Sambhuti Mupashyate Those who are engaged in the worship of demigods enter into the darkest region of ignorance, and still more so do the worshippers of the impersonal absolute. Now here you may wonder, well it says that worshippers of the demigods enter into the darkest region of ignorance. I thought the worshippers of the demigods go to the planets of the demigods, right? Go to the planets of the demigods. Yes, that's right, you go to the planets of the demigods, which is in the material world. In other words, you won't go back to Godhead, you stay in the material world. And you may worship the demigods for some time, and then you'll fall down again from that place. You won't remain on the planet of the demigods, you'll go back down into the lower regions of the material existence, into the darkness. So that's the problem. And if we worship the impersonal absolute, the, Brahm, the Brahma Jyoti, then that is even worse. Because if we worship the impersonal Brahman, where do you go? You'll go into the, well, you may go into the Brahman, maybe, if you're lucky, but you won't stay there in the Brahman. You can go there for some time, but then you'll fall back to the material world again, and you'll go down into the darkest regions. So the demigod worship is described there. Here the demigod, Ishopanishad points out, one who worships the demigods and attains to their material planets still remains in the darkest region of the universe. The whole universe is covered by a gigantic material, by the gigantic material elements. And it's just like a coconut covered by a shell and half filled with water. Its covering is airtight and the darkness within is dense. And therefore the sun and the moon are required for illumination. And impersonalism, Prabhupada describes the ignorant pseudo-religionists and the manufacturers of so-called incarnations who directly violate the Vedic injunctions are liable to enter into the darkest region of the universe 
because they mislead those who follow them. These impersonalists generally pose themselves as incarnations of God to foolish, of, to foolish persons who have no knowledge of Vedic wisdom. If such foolish men have any knowledge at all, it is more dangerous in their hands than ignorance itself. So impersonalism is described here. So Prabhupada's mood and mission was to save us from these things, right? Nirvisesha shunyavadi paschatya deshatarine. This was part of Prabhupada's mission. Prabhupada continues talking about these people. He said, these rogues are the most dangerous elements in human society. They escape punishment by the law of the state. They cannot, however, escape the law of the Supreme, who has clearly declared in the, in the Gita that envious demons in the garb of religious propagandists shall be thrown in the darkest region of hell. Bhagavad Gita, chapter 16, text 19-20. Sri Upanishad confirms that these pseudo-religionists are heading towards the most obnoxious place in the universe after the completion of their spiritual master's business, which they conduct simply for sense gratification. All right, so tonight we talked about the mantras 9 to 14. We're explaining about the relative and the absolute in terms of knowledge and worship, right? And we explained also the statement from Mantra 9 about the education of a modern, uh, or the advancement of education to a modern society. That we want to warn them of the danger of education. That while education is good, that we have to know how to use it. Everything, like a knife, can be used to heal, but a knife can be used to kill. Everything, to, how you use it. So we want, education is like that. And then, the, the, the process of spiritual life given to us by Srila Prabhupada enables us to achieve a balanced program, spiritual and material knowledge, with examples from our own experience and references from Shastra. Right? We cultivate knowledge side by side with nations. We have to know about the dangers of the material life. At the same time, we have to live in this material world. We have to use it. Use it in the service of Krishna. Then, appropriate attitudes to a Bhakti Shastri graduate. He shouldn't be proud. Don't think, well, I know all this, I've studied all this, I know everything. Be humble. One who is actually in knowledge will be humble and give respect to others. Then Prabhupada's mood and mission regarding demigod worship and impersonalism. The Prabhupada was very concerned in this. He wanted people to understand that it is Lord Krishna, who is the Supreme Lord, and you worship the demigods, the results will be limited and temporary. People with a small knowledge will worship the demigods to get results which are limited and temporary. And impersonalism is even more dangerous because it will put one into the darkest region of existence. Oh, all right. So, this is it. Any questions? So, next time I come, we'll finish this issue punishment.
No questions? Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada ki. Gaur Bhakti Vrinda ki. Hare Krishna. Sri Ishopanishad, the knowledge which brings us closer to Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So I hope you're coming closer to Krishna. I know you're already Krishna devotees. You're already very close. We just want to encourage you, keep coming, come closer, keep, keep going, don't stop. Hare Krishna. Wow, sweet has been prepared for everyone. Very nice. Hare Krishna. It's all in us, Bhakti Pinamanasa Nashan Swami Maharaj Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So please come fix Jagannath Mahapurusha. Okay, ready.